Good morning, good to see you. How many are ready for a really good sermon? You, yeah, you're ready today. You, you know you're going to get one today. It's, it's going to be awesome on it. What a week we've had in our week of hope. If you were here Wednesday night, is about 1,400 adults plus the Spanish, plus the kids were packing uh, kits for overseas until they lost. They, they just ran out of stuff, and we, they wanted to do some more. And ladies, uh, breakfast with women's empowerment. Ladies, if you miss it, oh, what, a, what an encouraging time. Today, I am so honored to have... Uh, Hal Donaldson with us today. He is the founder of Convoy of Hope, began out of the back of his truck. You're going to hear about his story, the heart of all this that really uh, changes the world. We also have Pastor Keith. Pastor Keith is back. How many remember Pastor Keith? Can I hear a good amen? Yeah. He was here 40, 50 years. Uh, he was such instrumental before and during and then transition and my friend and and walk through us in all these journeys, and now God has called them to come alongside uh, Hal and the team, and they are changing the world. Over a uh, billion dollars worth of food and services have been given to needy people, starting in the back of the truck. He has written, Hal has written over 30 books, and uh, he's just changing the world. I, I, I love this man because I, kinda, I consider him to be the Mother Teresa of our generation. And I say that because I had a privilege of knowing Mother Teresa a little bit and being when she received her Medal of Honor. Not only do they learn to change the world by giving, but to give hope and Christ and to change a community and agriculturally. And I want you to know, folks, today you're going to leave encouraged. You're going to leave blessed because Jesus, with his people, can change the world. Can I hear a good amen? Would you welcome Pastor Donaldson, Pastor Keith, come on up here and give them a great big Calvary welcome if you would. Bless you, Hal. Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be with you, and we've been looking forward to this for some time, for the opportunity just to thank you for your years of support of Convoy of Hope. And it's just a privilege to partner with you to bring a lasting change to thousands and thousands of lives. And we also want to salute your pastor today. Um, as you know, he is a friend to the poor and the suffering. He's a man with great compassion and kindness. And uh, every year, Convoy of Hope gives away an award called the President's Award. And this year's recipient, via our board of directors, is your pastor, Pastor Ross. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Hal. Thank you, Keith. Love you. Thank you. Love you, too. Wow, that's awesome, isn't it? This is all of our award. All of our award. This one. Thank you. You may be seated. I just wish my wife was here today to know that I've done something with my life, but thank you all <laughs> very much. Bless you guys. Go ahead, guys. Man, good morning. It is so great to see all of you, to be home. See your smiling faces. I've been looking forward to this day, and uh, it just feels natural. It's so good to be home and see so many friends. Pastor, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, the investments you've made in my life, my family's life, uh, in leadership at Calvary, and the investments you've made in Convoy, thank you. We deeply, deeply appreciate it and love you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to come this week and have some of the team from Convoy be here, and thank you for the opportunity to take these few moments this morning and share with you about Convoy of Hope. Next year, Convoy of Hope will celebrate our 25th birthday. In the past 24 years, we've had the opportunity to help people in need and share Christ with over 100 million people, providing 262 million meals, mobilizing over 616,000 volunteers, serving in 115 countries. And as excited as we are about that fact, we also really understand that our work has just begun. Did you know about 736 million people live in extreme poverty? living on less than $1.90 a day. More than 821 million 
people don't have enough food to eat. 844 million people do not have adequate access to clean drinking water. And human impact from natural disasters is staggering. In just the last 22 months, more than 350 disasters have affected over 100 million people. In the midst of all that pain and all that suffering, Convoy of Hope is committed to expressing the love of Christ through tangible acts of compassion. Our work is aimed at addressing the physical and the spiritual needs of the marginalized in some of the most desperate situations and places in the world. Working through the local church, it is our mission to break the cycle of poverty that holds so many captive and bring them the exciting and freeing message of Jesus Christ. From an international perspective, let me just frame a few things for you quickly. But from an international perspective, we address these problems through three primary interventions. First of all, children's feeding. We are currently feeding about 200,000 uh, children every school day. And the beautiful thing is, is that we're doing it through, mainly through the church and through church schools. We focus on schools because if we provide a meal, kids will stay in school. For, most of the, for many of those kids, that's their only meal. And if we don't provide the meal, not only will they not go to school, they will be forced to go and rummage through garbage dumps and go to uh, populated areas and, and beg for food. So if we give them food, they'll stay in school, they get an education, and begin to accumulate the tools to make a better life for themselves. And we have found that when we feed a community's children, we gain access to the whole family. And that's really the key for us in breaking that cycle of poverty. The second intervention is women's empowerment. And to date, we have, um, this year, we have trained and empowered over 6,700 women through education, microenterprise. We have now helped over just under 16,000 uh, 16, women. We've helped them find employment, start a business, and we help the girls begin to build a future. In many of the contexts that we work, women um, are treated as if they are second class, and that's not all right with us. And so we want to invest in the young girls and help them understand that they can have a future. We teach them basic business principles. We give them seed capital and stay with them for the first year to make sure that they're set up to succeed. With the girls, we teach them preventative measures, leadership, life skills, self-esteem. And in many of these situations, when we equip a woman to start a business, it is, to say the least, transformative. It transforms that individual. It transforms their family. It brings hope. Instead of wondering where their next meal will come from, not only will they have food, they'll have a future. And it transforms the community. We have cases where uh, ladies have started a business and it not only provides for their family, but they're able to, to hire people from their neighborhood. And there's an economic lift. The third intervention is agriculture. This year, to date, we have trained over 6,400 individuals through resource and education. We teach farmers best practices and modern methods. Now these farmers have seen their yields increase 2 to 300%, and they're tithing 10% back of their crops to help feed more children in their villages. Once where there was no hope, there was a sense that nothing could change. Now they're part of the solution. They're part of the answer, and they have the pride and the honor to help feed those around them that are so hungry. Since 2011, we have trained and resourced in agriculture over 20. 23,000 people, making them self-sufficient, making a future that is sustainable for them. You know, we've learned that if we feed the kids, set the mothers up in business, and help them grow their own food, we give them the tools that they need to be able to beat, to break the cycle of poverty. And in the process, what's so exciting to me is we get to share Jesus with them. And we see lives changed, and we get to see them integrated in, local in a local church. In addition to international program, domestically, 
Down through the years, we've done over 800 outreaches, and we partner with businesses and civic organizations, and most importantly, churches, in going into some of the most difficult areas in America. Rural compassion reaches to the poverty that is in rural areas that is unknown and unheard of and hidden in many cases. In the fall of 1998, though, we began disaster services. And since then, we have responded to 372 disasters here in America and around the world. Today, currently, we're in Indonesia, Myanmar, India, and the Philippines. We have learned that in these moments of incredible disaster, it is an opportunity for the church to shine. It's an opportunity for the church to step into the pain and into the suffering. And in some of these contexts, contexts it changes how people see the church and gives them an opportunity to be the church, to be salt, and to be light. Domestically, we're in the Carolinas, and we just got a report yesterday that one of the churches that we partner with in the Carolinas in the, in the storm of Florence, that since the storm, they've had 161 people come to Jesus Christ. We're in Florida, of course, in the panhandle, and we've already sent and routed 100 truckloads of, of products. Some of those, just like you packed on Wednesday night, meet people at their great moment of need. And uh, we've served over 100,000 people so far. One of the things about convoys, when the lights are off and the trucks are gone, it's our heart to still be there to help people put their lives back That's together. Right. I want to give you just a quick update and let you see some of the things that are happening in Florida. Lord bless you. Watch this. It's hard to imagine the power of a hurricane, especially a hurricane as powerful as Michael. As we've driven through the communities in the panhandle of Florida, the destruction that we've seen has been mind-boggling. We have seen buildings flattened, homes destroyed, power lines down, even railroad trains flipped onto their sides. One of the things that Convoy of Hope does best is the distribution of food, water, and emergency supplies. Convoy of Hope is committed to those affected by Hurricane Michael for the long haul. We will continue to work with volunteers in this community and continue to bring hope and help to people in need. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I do want to thank Pastor Ross, and I want to thank you for your investment. And Keith Boucher, he and Kim have been unbelievable blessings to Convoy of Hope and the mission. Keith, just thank you so much for all you've done. Great to be with you today. Well, it was 24 years ago that I loaded up a pickup truck with groceries and went into a needy area in Northern California, and I stood up on the back of that truck, and I told people, Jesus loves you. And I just started passing out groceries to hurting people. And that was the start of Convoy of Hope. And since that time, we have seen literally hundreds of thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And we've seen thousands of people and families break free from the cycle of poverty. And you've been a part of that. And so today, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. Well, today, Pastor Ross asked me to share with you my story because it was out of my personal tragedy that God raised up Convoy of Hope. But first, I want us to take a brief look at another man's story found in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Skipping down to verse 6. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Well, first note that this man could not see Jesus, but Jesus sees him. And Jesus' life has just been threatened They've told Jesus, we're going to kill you, we are going to stone you. But yet, a loving Jesus still takes the time to stop and to walk over to a man. Well, through a personal experience, Jesus reminded me that he's still stopping. 
and he's still going to great lengths to wrap his loving arms around hurting people. But today, you and I are his messengers. This is what happened. As Pastor said, I've written a number of books, and I decided that I was going to write my very first novel. And so on a Saturday morning, I began writing out the first chapter, and I created a character named Elizabeth O'Grady. In this opening chapter, I described her as the mother of two small children, a single mother, unemployed, and the chapter ends with her being in an auto accident. Well, just four days later, I was on my way to work, and the car behind me lost control and hit me going about maybe 25 miles an hour. Fortunately, I was okay, but I hopped out of the car to go check on the other driver, and it was a young woman, and she was crying, and I tried to calm her down before the police arrived. And I said, ma'am, what's your name? I want to pray for you. And she said, my name is Elizabeth O'Grady, the same name I'd written four days earlier. I think you can understand, that was a twilight zone moment for me. And I said, God, you're up to something, something's going on. Several weeks later, my wife and I arranged to have dinner with Elizabeth. And over dinner, she told us her story, how she was separated from her husband, two small kids, unemployed, she had borrowed the car, that she hit me in, and she was having a very difficult time. But right there over dinner, we told her how Jesus had revealed her name to us in advance, and Jesus had seen her need, and he'd sent us to respond on his behalf. And this young woman began to cry as we prayed with her to commit her life to Jesus, but also her problems. And it thrills me this morning to tell you that today Elizabeth O'Grady is serving Jesus. Can we give the Lord a hand? Yes. Everywhere Jesus went, he encountered people like Elizabeth, people who were in crisis. And he didn't heal everyone, but Jesus was willing to stop for anyone. He asked Jesus, he asked his father every day, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to talk to? And today, you two are surrounded by needs. Everywhere you turn, you're encountered by people who are in crisis, people who are lonely. Right here in Naperville, so many hurting, lost, lonely people. So the question facing us today is this. What does Jesus expect from us in a world of need? Well, first, he's not asking you to meet every need, and he's not asking you to feed every child but he is asking you to stop long enough to see the needs around you and to ask the question, Jesus, is there something you want me to do? Years ago, at the invitation of famed missionaries Mark and Hulda Bentain, I traveled to Calcutta, India to help them write a book. And when I arrived, they told me that they had arranged a private meeting with Mother Teresa. And in the course of that conversation with Mother Teresa, she asked me, she said, young man, what are you doing to help the poor of the suffering? And I was smart enough to realize it was probably not a good idea to lie to Mother Teresa, right? And so I told her the truth. I said, I I'm really not doing much of anything. And she replied, everyone can do something. Just do the next kind thing that Jesus puts in front of you. This morning, what a great word for you and me. What does Jesus expect from us? To do just the next kind thing that Jesus puts in front of us. I do want to interject this. Yes, let's give the Lord a hand. I do want to interject this very quickly. You may be here and you have loved ones who have drifted away from God. And like the blind man... They can't see Jesus. I want you to know today that Jesus sees them. Keep praying, keep believing for a miracle. If Jesus can do a miracle in the life of a blind man, and he can use crash evangelism to reach Elizabeth O'Grady, he can do a miracle in your friends' and family members' lives too. That's the truth. Let's believe God for miracles. Next, we see that Jesus goes beyond pity, and he meets this man's practical, tangible need. He restores his sight. Jesus didn't go up to the man and pat him on the back and 
and smile and say a few comforting words, shed a few tears, and then walk away. No, Jesus went beyond pity, and he did something. And the fact is that the enemy of this world could care less if you and I have pity. We can have all the pity we want because pity has no power. It will not feed a hungry child. It will not rescue an abandoned mother. The enemy just doesn't want us to respond in a practical, tangible way because the enemy knows that there are millions of people who are one touch away from finding Jesus. I've seen it all over the world, all over the United States, how one cup of water, one coat, one blanket, one pair of glasses, one bag of groceries can change a life forever and give people hope. I'm standing here today because one family went beyond pity when tragedy struck our family in 1969. This particular night, my parents were on their way to a business meeting and their car was hit head on by a drunken driver. My father was killed instantly. My mother was seriously injured. She'd be in the hospital for some months with a body cast and many internal injuries. We didn't know if she was going to make it. But that night changed my life. It changed my life because my father didn't have insurance and the man who hit him didn't have insurance. And so our family was forced to survive on welfare. We often had to go to school with holes in our shoes and holes in our jeans. And that's before it was cool to have holes in your jeans. You know what I mean? But there were days the cupboards were empty. And we would have to go to school without a sack lunch in our hands. But honestly, friends, we made it. We made it because of kind and generous people like you who would come to our door week after week with bags of groceries. People like to ask me, how, what, what difference can a bag of groceries make? Trust me, for a hungry child, it makes all the difference in the world. It gives you hope that tomorrow can be better than today. It does. And when those bags would come to our door, I have to tell you, it was like Christmas all over again. We would run to those bags and tear into them, just hoping for like a, a box of Fruit Loops or Captain Crunch, if you know what I'm talking about. But I will never forget the night that two police officers knocked on our door to tell us that my father was dead and my mother was fighting for her life. In the waning hours, neighbors began to gather in the front of our house and the police officer stepped up to the porch and he addressed the crowd. And he said, are there any family members or friends here tonight who are willing to take the children home with them? If not, we'll take them downtown to the station. And I'm sure it was a matter of seconds, but for a 12-year-old boy who had lost his father, who was scared to death, it felt like minutes before someone responded. But finally, one young couple did. They said, we'll take them. I'm sure they thought we would be staying with them for maybe a night or two. We ended up living with Bill and Levada Davis in their single wide trailer for a year. All 10 of us lived in a trailer. There weren't enough beds and so we took turns sleeping on the floor. But you see, the Davises saw caring for us four children as their God-given mission. They sacrificed their privacy, they drained their savings account so four kids could have a home. But candidly, as a 12-year-old boy, I struggled. I could not understand how a loving God could take a father, from four, a father of four children away from them. I didn't understand why now I had to feel the shame of poverty, standing in light at grocery stores with food stamps and going to school without the nicest clothes. I felt so inferior to everyone else, and I had lots of insecurities and a lot of questions. But one day, Bill Davis, the father, came and he threw his arm over my shoulder. He knew I was hurting, and he said, Hal, listen to me. Listen to me. Don't allow the tragedy of your youth to become a lifelong excuse because where you start in life doesn't have to dictate where you end. Isn't that a great word? Yes. Praise the Lord. 
But friends, when the Davises said, we'll take them, we'll feed them, I believe it was that day in 1969 that they set the Convoy of Hope miracle into motion. Without the Davises, I don't believe there would be a Convoy of Hope, and I don't believe I would be standing here today. The Davises just did the next kind thing that Jesus put in front of them. Friends, my story is not a woe is me story. It is a greater is he story. Why? Because one family went beyond pity. I'm sure the enemy thought that he'd won a major victory the day my father took his last breath on that California highway. But little did the enemy know that God was going to take my father's mangled automobile and transform it into a fleet of Convoy of Hope trucks that would crisscross our country, offering hope to millions of people. Little did he know. Friends, when we see the needs around us, and like the Davises, we take action. It's at that moment that we invite God's supernatural favor on our lives. Deuteronomy 15 makes it very clear. It says that he will bless our homes, our finances, our health, and our work. My wife and I have four daughters, and I've told them through the years, what you do for the poor and the suffering, God will do for you. And one day I was riding with my youngest daughter, Hallie, riding with her in the car, and Hallie is 18 now, but back there when she was 10, when she was 10, Hallie had the gift of manipulation. <laughs> you know I'm talking about, yeah. Riding in the car together, and out of the blue, she says, hey, Dad, God wants me to have an ice cream cone. <laughs> I said, really? Now, how do you know that? And she said, well, I gave my allowance to Convoy of Hope. You said God would give back to me. I really want a cone. We've worked hard on our theology, haven't we, dear? He hasn't promised us ice cream cones, but he has promised to bless everything we set our hand to if we go beyond pity and we respond to the needs of hurting people. You may have entered this church today, and you have many needs of your own. And quite frankly, you haven't known what to do. And even last night, you put your head on your pillow and the stress kept you awake. Please know that Jesus sees every deed you have. He's not distracted, nor is he disinterested. Proverbs 15, 3 says, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. He knows everything you're going through. He knows every single detail. But he also sees the pain and the suffering of others. And as you go beyond pity and you respond to the needs of others, watch what he does for you. That's just the way it works. And lastly, in John chapter 9, we see that Jesus offers this blind man the gift of salvation. This is how it goes down. After the man is healed, he goes about rejoicing and celebrating and telling everyone about his miracle. I mean, he's one happy dude. But in John chapter 9, verse 35, sometime later, Jesus goes searching for the man, and he finds him. And he tells him, I am the son of the living God, and the man believes and receives his gift of salvation. As Keith said very well earlier, you see, for Jesus, it wasn't enough just to, for this man to receive his sight. Jesus wanted to put an end to his spiritual blindness. And even at Convoy of Hope, we don't want to just feed stomachs. We also want to feed souls. Each year, Convoy of Hope we, we distribute thousands and tens of thousands of hot dogs at our citywide outreaches across the nation. And on one Saturday, I decided I was going to work in the hot dog stand. I hadn't done that before, and so I thought that would be a great experience. And there was this one scrawny kid who approached the hot dog stand, and he, he asked me in the saddest voice imaginable, he said, can I have a hot dog? I said, sure. Do you want one with mustard? Do you want it with ketchup? Do you want it with mustard and ketchup, or do you want it plain? This kid was really, really smart. He said, can I have one of each? <laughs> and so I loaded that kid up with hot dogs that day, and he proceeded to stick one hot dog in each pocket. Friends, four hot dogs costing less than one dollar brought hope to one hungry boy, and that day I saw that boy receive Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise God. Giving hope to people is not expensive. 
but neither is it free. It requires that you and I choose a life of generosity so others can be rescued for eternity. I want to close with this story. I visited Kenya, one of our feeding programs there. It's in a place called Mathari Valley. Mathari Valley is one of the poorest places on the planet. I've traveled all over the world. I can't think of one more poor and heart-wrenching than Mathari. 700,000 people live in a city of children's forts, tiny hovels made of plastic and tarps and plywood. No running water, no electricity, no sewage system. But in the middle of Mathari Valley is an oasis of sort, a, a school, where with your help, we're feeding 1,000 children every single day. And I stood in that schoolyard, and I have to tell you, it was so fulfilling to see a thousand kids in uniform standing in line to receive their nutritious meal, knowing they were being educated, but also knowing that they were learning about Jesus. But then I peered around the exterior of that schoolyard, and I saw dozens of eyes peering at me through the fence from the outside. So I walked outside through the gate, and sure enough, dozens of children came stampeding toward me. They didn't have uniforms. They didn't have shoes. They weren't being educated. These were the kids who were eating off the garbage heap, the kids who were sniffing glue to take away their hunger, the kids lapping water out of streams that are filled with sewage. And that day, friend, it hit me hard, really hard. That caring for a 1,000 kids in a place like Mathari isn't enough. It's just not enough. Because chances are, if we don't find a way to get those kids inside that fence, they'll never have a future, and they won't know that Jesus loves them. Here's the sad reality. If we don't feed them, if you and I don't feed them, the terrorists will. They'll try to buy their soul for a bowl of rice. And friends, that is absolutely unacceptable when in some countries we can feed a child for 25 cents a day. It's unacceptable when 16,000 children are dying every single day because of hunger and water-related causes. It's just unacceptable. I just don't believe that God wants his church and his people to take it sitting down. He wants to work through you and me to avert thousands and thousands of human tragedies. He's looking for people like us who will stand up and say, enough is enough, that is unacceptable, with, but with God's help, I'm going to do something about it. Three years ago, Convoy of Hope was feeding less than 150,000 children a day. 150,000. We began to pray. We said, God, that's not enough. And we set a lofty goal. We said, what if we could add 10,000 kids every year for the next five years, so that by the year 2020, we would be feeding 200,000 children a day. It absolutely thrills my heart today to announce to you that last month, we shot past that goal, and we are now feeding over 200,000 kids two years ahead of schedule. <laughs> Praise God. Praise the Lord. But friends, 200,000, we believe it's just the beginning. We believe it's in God's heart to feed and to disciple one million children every single day. And so today, I'm standing here on behalf of tens of thousands of children and just saying thank you for all you've done. Thank you for all you've done. And thank you for taking this journey with us to rescue one million children, children like Baraka. My name is Diana. I want to tell you about my friend Baraka. I call him my Baraka. Baraka is hardworking, loving, caring, and always put a smile on his face. I was little when my dad passed away. I don't remember him. My mom worked breaking stones so that we could eat. 
She would do anything to make sure that we had food. Every day of their lives, in the sun, when it rains, so it's really, it's a very hard job. Last year, we joined her to the UG program. She used to have a very big smile. She was like, I can do this because I know how to take care of anything concerning with farming. It felt so good having my mother take care of me. She was a very cheerful lady, wonderful, hardworking, and everyone here in our small town loved her. But one day, mom was in an accident. She was hit by a motorbike. After two days, she passed away. I felt like I had lost the most valuable thing in the world. I felt like I didn't deserve to live anymore. I was so depressed. And then I told my brothers and sisters, we have to do something with our lives so that people won't say that our mother didn't raise us well. So I started with one chicken, and the people from Convoy came and trained me, and the number kept growing. The business that the mother started, it's flourishing. Diana taught me how to plant vegetables, and soon I started selling some of it and bringing the others home to eat. The Convoy of Hope Agriculture Program, it's now feeding the whole family through Baraka. After doing all of this, Baraka did not drop out of school. Baraka has taught me never to lose hope. He trusts God. I pray, and I know that God leads me in the best way. God knows what's coming in the future, and he sees beyond our circumstances. He leads me in the right way. When my mother passed away, I had to do what she did for us. Meeting the people from Convoy of Hope saved my life. We work with the people who need to have hope. Your help is very important to help other people like Baraka. You are one day of kindness transforms my everyday. Wow, isn't that, isn't that good news, folks? Can you give Hal and Keith and the whole team a great big hand for all that they do for God? Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Your family, all the sacrifices you made. Keith, thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Good news. So why am I crying? I don't know. I just love it because it works, folks. In a world... And, and it tries to tell you and I that Jesus doesn't do anything for people. That religion, Christ, doesn't help at all. We see that Jesus and us as partners change the world. When I was uh, with them this past year uh, for a week and saw all this unfold and met some of the people uh, on the screen and I thought, oh, Lord, thank you. And I, I had the opportunity to speak for a, a little bit. I was a, a guest speaker on an afternoon session. And you, you hear all these famous things and what's a preacher going to say? And you know what God laid in my heart and I want to share it with you just right now. And that is generosity is good for you and me. Of course it changes the world, right? Of course you want to be part of something that not only uh, helps people have a full stomach but gives them Jesus and a plan and a future. What perfect thing. But what I have found in my life is that when I overcome my barrier for generosity and self-defensiveness and, and this is mine and I do my tithe and I do my missions and I become generous not only on days like compassion but with waiters and waitresses and all the things that we do that I am better. I'm a better, I feel better. Can I hear an amen on that? I feel joy. I know God's pleasure because God is looking for us. And so when we ask you today, once a year, we do this, we do our faith promises for the missionaries. And then in the fall, we do our compassion ministry. And I'm so glad that we have something like Convoy that really makes a difference. And so I can with full confidence tell you this is changing lives and we can do it together. That week, I, my wife and I were there, and we made our largest uh, compassion commitment without knowing what you do. And 
after prayer, I committed you to your largest gift. I just thought you ought to know that. There was so much joy to say, I commit the congregation along with me. I'm not alone in this deal. And uh, I want you to pray with me now. Will you have your, your envelope, if you would, have the Convoy of Hope. And inside of it is your uh, Week of Hope card. It's very simple. What you, uh, through prayer and uh, love and, and hearing God's voice, want to do above your regular tithe because we do all kinds of stuff. We just started this week a South Chicago initiative. We'll tell you about it. So above of that, as God places in your heart what generous, generous sacrificial thing that you would do for Jesus, you put that on there. It's between you and the Lord. It's not like anyone's going to beat on your door or come after on it. And I promise you this will go for compassion ministry here uh, through Convoy of Hope as we minister to the world. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to really pray about this. You are a giving church. So many of you are giving. So many of you have done this for 52 years in part of the church. I know who you are, and I, I respect that. But I want you to see the opportunity, and I want you to say, Lord, here's what we want to see you do again freshly in us. So if you take that card in your hand, and the ushers are going to come forward, we're going to pray for a moment. And you could go online and give. This is due uh, before the end of the year, hopefully next 30 days, you can give a commitment. We're going to receive an offering now as kind of a, just a seed faith kind of doing. Say, Lord, this is just a, a part of it. It could be uh, something you do all your pledge now or just say, hey, we're going to just give an offering and we're going to, by the end of the December, make this as God enables us along the way. If you'll put it on it, we know how to prepare. We know how to uh, Make sure everything goes to the proper place on it. But what I want you to do, are you listening? Can I hear an amen? I want you to feel the joy of God's pleasure. I don't want you to hear condemnation and just someone's going to die without us. Probably that's true, but I want you to see the smile of God, how he takes us in our hardship like how, and turns around and uses your life to change the world. So let's, let's join in this. Can we pray together openly? Father, we ask you right now to speak to us. You are good. You are good to us. You have blessed us. You, you have given us salvation and joy and a fellowship. We get to come here today and, and be encouraged and to know each other and to, to hear the word. And you have asked us to take care of the hungry. You told your disciples to feed them and they didn't know how they were going to do it, but you just knew what you were going to do. So, Lord, great and small, whether this is a small first-time step for them and they enter into generosity or this is a moment of destiny and, Lord, they know now you bless them for this very reason, to be a blessing. We do this in worship and thankfulness in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, if you prepare your offering and, and get it ready to give and remember you can Bring your card in today. You can put in the offering. Go ahead, off, uh, guys and ladies, take the offering. Or you can bring it next week anytime along the way and do it. But let's, let's kind of just worship the Lord right where we're sitting and we'll be done really uh, right on time. Pastor, Pastor Stephen, lead us in worship, please. All of the heavens and the earth Announce the fullness of your word this we know, this we know. And every enemy will flee. As we declare your victory. This we know, this we know. And I will call. Good day. Can 
I hear a good amen? It is good to be part of something changing the world. It's good to be part of God's family. Next week, we're going to get back and finish up Abraham. I guarantee you, it's a surprise. Any? How many of you want to end life well? Yeah, all the people over 60 just raised their hand. God help us, right? We're going to talk about what an older Abraham tells young people about enjoying life. And we're going to have it, so bring a friend. Let me pray for you, and I thank you as you prayfully consider all this and keep going and being generous and let's change our community our world for jesus christ lord thank you for encouraging us and opening our hearts to your heart so lord may it fall on good ground may we live this out in our life believing not only has Hal has found out what God can do, we discover in our family, our neighborhoods, our schools, our businesses, Lord, what you can do on a daily basis as we have compassion one for another and give them Jesus Christ too. We pray blessings in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. If you would like to have prayer, there'll be people here up front to pray with you. Go with God's blessing. See you this week. Yeah.